Okay, um, yeah, sorry for the delay. Um, there was an unfortunate problem here. Um, the laptop with the live demo doesn't work with the projector, so I can't actually show any of the features. Um, I only have the, the backup slides. Um, we have most of this at our booth, um, so if you actually want to see it in action, um, we have to do it there. Um, yeah, what I'm actually going to talk about, um, Gamma Ray. Who here has already used Gamma Ray? Well, that's few people. Who here has at least some understanding of what it does and what it is? Okay, that's a few more. Um, so let's briefly go through the, um, the basics on uh, what it actually is. So it's an, uh, a runtime introspection tool for Qt. Um, if you know things like the web inspector or Firebug uh, in, in browsers, which allows you to see live what's happening on a, on a web page, it's essentially that for Qt. So it's, uh, it's a tool you attach to, um, to your Qt application, and it shows you the, the object tree, the properties of the individual objects, um, and then some, some higher level um, tools and visualizations on top of that, um, like the graphics uh, or the, uh, the graphics scene in, in Qt Quick. Um, so uh, it helps you with, with debugging and, and profiling problems. Um, and it's, it's essentially similar to a debugger in, in terms of usage. So either you launch an application directly with, with Gamma Ray attached, um, or you, you attach it at runtime. Um, and just like a debugger, you need no modifications on, on your application. Um, debug build is beneficial, but not required. So you, you get a lot of information, even on random cute binaries you find on your system. Um, if you're on Windows, uh, you will notice that there's the drive one client uh, that's written with Qt Quick. So you can actually try that on a process already running on your system uh, without source code or, or debug build. Um, you can use that uh, yeah, locally on your machine or on an, on an embedded target. Um, the way it works is you have a, a small um, DLL that's injected into uh, the target application that then provides access to the data and, and communication. Um, that part is very specific to the Qt version you're using. So in practice, that means you need to build that part of Gamma Ray at least for your specific uh, Qt configuration. Um, and yeah, that's, that's usually the, the biggest challenge in, in getting it to work. Uh, in terms of UI, um, there's a command line interface like a, a debugger, there's a, a graphical tool to select the process you want to attach, and we also have a creator integration where you can just press start in, or launch in, in creator and you get the application running with, uh, with Gamma Ray. Um, and that's the part I wanted to do as a live demo, so a few examples on what you can actually use this for in, in practice. Um, I did a similar talk um, last year with uh, a few more examples. Um, those were a bit more basic. The, the ones I have for this year are somewhat more specialized, um, but also touching all parts of, of Qt. So we are going to see some, some widget uh, problems and some, some Qt quick problems being analyzed with, uh, with Gamma Ray. Um, so um, the first problem, you might encounter, especially since we are in the automotive track, in like very large Qt Quick applications, like you find in um, in automotive programs, um, you find yourself with um, a very high um, video memory use. So something is accumulating textures. Um, you can look at that with tools like Render Doc or API Trace, and you see what's in your video memory, but you don't really know where this is coming from. Um, and with the latest version of Gamma Ray, we have the ability to actually see the textures uh, related to Qt Quick items. Um, I have a screenshot on the next uh, slide. 
Um, so this is uh, gamma ray or parts of gamma ray attached to the um, uh, Neptune UI, which is also part of Qt or Qt Automotive Suite. Um, and uh, it has a, a specific image selected that is in a, in a texture atlas. So the first thing you can see is which of my images are actually ending up in a texture atlas because that has huge performance benefits if, if it's in there, right? And if you find some of your stuff outside, you might want to increase the, the texture atlas size. If you find stuff in the atlas that shouldn't be there, like your initial startup splash screen that then just fills out the entire atlas, then you might want to make sure it stays outside. Um, going further, and that's the overlay we see here, um, I mean, most of those graphics you get from a graphic designer, right? Those are typically people that don't think about the memory requirement at one time, right? They give you Photoshop layers. Um, like the example we have selected here, this is a tiny cluster dial needle in, with lots of transparent space around it because that's how the designer did the layouting, right? So you get the full a uh, full-sized image uh, and basically abusing transparent pixels as, uh, as a layouting mechanism. Um, but that, of course, costs you a lot of unnecessary memory. Because the transparent pixels are just as expensive as those with relevant content, right? Um, and uh, as we see at the bottom, this is uh, about two megabytes uh, just wasted in transparency in this specific case. Um, and that's even without optimizing the rotation of the needle to actually make it as small as possible. Um, and if you try that on, on your average Qt Trick application, it's surprising how much optimization potential, even with some primitive uh, uh, metrics like down here, can be found. Um, a lot of stuff you can simplify, like the one we see at the um, at the top left, um, that could be done with a border image because the center part of that is essentially a black rectangle, right? So it's just repeated content. Um, so gamma ray, that, uh, in this case, gives you the, um, the tools to inspect what's actually in the texture atlases and what is separate and how much of the data in there is actually really necessary and how much you could optimize away by well, cutting off uh, transparent uh, borders, using border image to repeat similar content. Um, right, and <clears throat> doing this with conventional debugging tools is, um, uh, well, not impossible, but uh, extremely inconvenient. And uh, what we don't see in the screenshot, um, next to that you have the, the entire item hierarchy, so you can select the individual image causing this, and you can navigate to the source code uh, where that problem comes from. Um, and that, that we can also uh, show live at the, at the booth if you want to see it. Um, another problem, uh, somewhat easier to explain, um, especially for people using um, complex widget input UI, so setting style logs or forms in, in whatever form. Um, getting the tab order right is, well, it's not hard, but testing all your input dialogues to, to see if the tab order is actually correct or if you're suddenly jumping back to, an, uh, to a widget that you inserted later, right? It's just annoying work. Um, and that's another thing where Gamma Ray can help you if you select um, a widget uh, it has an option to visualize the, um, the tab order. And as you see, as, as long as we are following the green path, that is kind of okay, right, going through the columns. Uh, but then, obviously, you have some uh, elements that will be some later, and then we see the, the red arrow going back, um, crossing all the other things. Um, so you immediately see where you need to fix your, your tab order. So, and going through your application, looking at that is much easier than actually tabbing through everything um, in the application. So it's a, a fairly nice little helper, but that's the kind of stuff we try to build into Gamma Ray. So um, it helps you with this kind of actual problems and, and tries to save you some time. 
Um, yeah, that would kind of make sense. Anyone from the designer team here? <laughs> uh, I mean, designer shows you the, the order as well, but it, it doesn't show you the, I mean, this is a fairly primitive metric, just if two lines cross, make them red. Um, you could do something like that in designer, right? Um, but that limits you also to designer, right? So this adapts to some elements being disabled at one time. This works with stuff that isn't coming out of designer, like dynamically generated forms that some people are using. Um, so yeah, it, it makes sense in designer, but there's still use cases where you want this uh, additional. So, um, oh yeah, and then another common annoying problem in when working with QML is uh, binding loops. Um, I mean, you get a runtime warning. Uh, saying source line here, I have a binding loop, right? But it doesn't tell you why. Um, sometimes that's obvious, right? If you write code like A equals B and B equals A, sure, you see that in the code. Um, but for layouting, there's a lot of implicit dependencies. So sizes and margins depend on each other. Um, so if you do the, the anchoring, um, you don't see that in the code, so you need to know there are specific dependencies. Um, in Gamma Ray, we now have a, it, that's not even merged yet into master, that's uh, really, really brand new. Um, we can now show you the, the entire uh, hierarchy of, uh, of bindings, um, including the implicit ones. So the implicit ones are those that don't have a source location attached. Um, they are coming from the layouting system. So in this case, you actually can see the implicit dependency and know what you need to adjust um, uh, to fix that binding loop, because that's most likely messing up something in your, in your layouting. I mean, this is just a small building block to address the entire problem of debugging binding loops. There's, um, uh, David Edmondson, who is also somewhere around here, he had an entire talk at KDE Academy on how to debug this really in depth. So you can fill an entire session with that. Um, but that's a, a nice little tool um, just to see um, what your actual dependencies are. Uh, and of course, if you select one of the lines that have source code attached, you can immediately jump to that position in source code um, to see what else is going on there or to, to fix it. Um, how much time do I have left? Okay, one more example. Um, if you have a problem with uh, timers going out of control, so timer running with a um, zero interval and you forgot to set it to single shot, so it's running in a continuous loop, um, you will see that as 100% CPU load in, in your application, right? Um, and what you do is you break in it with the debugger, you see what's actually causing the cost, and then you end up in queue timer timeout as the cause. But it doesn't tell you which timer, it doesn't tell you why that timer is fired. Um, and yeah, you basically have to, to guess at that point. Um, for that, we have a timer inspector in Gamma Ray. Um, that is actually fairly old in Gamma Ray, but it recently got a, a lot more useful um, by allowing object navigation. So um, here at the top, we see two timers going, uh, like having insane amount of wake ups and uh, uh, zero millisecond repeating. So that's basically just running in, a, in an infinite loop. If I right click on that, I can jump to the, the object causing that and I can jump to the source code where that timer is, uh, is created, right? So it, it gets me to the, the actual source of the problem. It doesn't show me there's a timer firing, it shows me which one. Um, and I can, well, stop it in the property editor, for example, to verify that that's actually the problem and there's nothing restarting it. Um, so there's, uh, I mean, we have, uh, most of Gamma Ray is, <coughs> just viewing what's going on, but you have the ability to change properties and core methods. Um, none of this is persistent, obviously, but it helps you to verify your, your theories on where your problem actually is, right? So if you assume 
that time I was accidentally left on, you switch it off and you see if it stays off, right? Or if there's something switching it on again, you would see that. All of that without restarting, without recompiling, um, just on the running application, possibly even running on an embedded target, right? So um, you save a lot of time on, on iterating. Um, right, so that's the, um, the examples I wanted to show you. Um, that leaves one remaining, questions, uh, uh, one remaining question. Where can I actually get this? Um, you find it on our website. It's just like Qt dual license, so you can have a GPL version. Um, and there's a commercial version that is, uh, for example, included in the Qt Automotive Suite. Um, the creator integration is exclusive to that. Uh, most of the other stuff I showed you, um, you get in the, in the GPL version as well. Um, I should mention that all, I, all the features I showed are, at, if at all, in like master, so for the 5.10 release end of the year. So this is brand new stuff. Um, and the binding stuff, that's even just a workbench. So if you actually want to get those features, you really need to build the very latest version um, from Git. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, any questions? Do we even still have time for questions? Well, barely. Yep. Right. Um, so the, the question is, can we uh, store or record the, the state of the application? Um, that's currently not possible uh, because the UI is only querying the minimal amount of state it needs because otherwise you end up with a huge amount of stuff. Um, I agree with the use case. I mean, recording in a production scenario and then analyzing it post-mortem, that would be very useful to have. Um, the challenge with that is managing the performance impact of really recording everything. I mean, it's, it's sometimes challenging already as it is uh, with just querying the, the amount we, we show, um, doing that for everything. Right, but even a snapshot is expensive. But yeah, I, I agree, the use case would be, uh, the use case would, that would also help me to have that, yeah. Yep. Um, can we open a call dump and inspect that? Uh, no, because the information we show is usually a lot more than what you find in a in a call dump. Well, no, if it's a call dump, it would it might actually work because you get the entire memory. Um, the problem is, it's not just reading memory; it's also calling into Qt functions, right? So we would actually need to execute code on it. Um, I mean, theoretically, you might be able to get this implemented somehow, but no, we, we don't have that. Is yep. it um, Is it working remotely? Um, yes, so it works on, on Android, on QNX, on Linux, um, and it's communicating over TCP, so the client can run on anything else in the, in the network, basically. Right, so you, you need to build the, uh, it's called the probe, so it's a, a small DLL that goes into the target uh, process and there's an, an injector command line tool, um, which works for, for Android, there's a, you basically need to compile it in because you can't do runtime in, uh, injection, um, but then you basically launch that with a, a gamma ray command line tool and then your target and then that depending on the platform, uses various tricks to get the, the probe into that. Uh, and that part you need to build for the target, and then the client can be, that can be any gamma ray version. So that part is, is fairly robust. So let's explain on the web page. 
there is documentation uh, on the web page that uh, explains the various ways on, uh, on getting disinfected. I mean, that's the part that the creator plugin simplifies because that hides that part from you. Um, otherwise, you need to do that by hand, depending on your platform. Yep. As far as I read, uh, it requires the same three uh, on the targets and also the, the camera. Uh, so typically, I think our project uh, becomes like a TV because we've got a TV library. And is it possible that we use camera? Um, so the question is about compatibility with various Qt versions. Um, Yes, it's, it's perfectly fine to build it against a pre-compiled Qt. Um, so you, you don't need to have a, a specific variant of Qt. It supports anything from 4.8 to, well, 5.10 def. Um, the only important thing is that the probe matches exactly the Qt version you use. So you need to build the, the probe basically in the same way you build your application. Same compiler flex, same Qt version, debug and release, um, depending on platform. I mean, Windows is specific. Is, is very pedantic there to, to have everything match exactly. Um, but wherever you got the Qt from doesn't really matter. So it works fine with pre-built Qt. I'm sorry, that it requires a lot of headers It does require private headers of Qt, but only those that are installed by a standard uh, SDK installation anyway. Um, and that's mainly for the Qt Quick Inspector. Um, because that doesn't have a lot of C++ API. So if you want to get to the interesting bits there, you need to private headers. And that's, on the other hand, that's the reason why you need to have it built exactly for the Qt version, because the internal API is changing all the time. Um, but that's where you get all the interesting bits of information. I mean, the texture stuff is uh, pretty much impossible with, with public API. Okay. Yep. Um, so the question is uh, on the performance impact on the target. Um, I mean, yes, it, it's instrumenting parts of, uh, of the, um, the event loop and the, the signal delivery and the object creation and destruction. Um, it will not be the same as if you're running without it, um, but it's, uh, and it, it depends a lot on how big your application is and what your application actually does. So object creation is affected and, and the whole signal and event handling. If you do a huge amount of that, you will notice more impact as if you are doing a sensible amount of that. Um, it's hard to give a, a general number because it's, I don't think it scales linearly. It scales with the amount of activity you have on events and uh, signals and object creation and destruction. Um, well, it works, uh, it works on, on really big applications where we have trouble is ap applications, even if they are small, if they are generating tens and tens of thousands of Q objects per second and destroying them again and generating them again. That's, but you shouldn't be doing that anyway. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it makes slow applications slower, but it doesn't mean that it makes big applications slower. Um, big usually works. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the, the license of the probe, um, that's the same as, as Gamma Ray, so it's GPL or commercial. Um, hmm? uh, no, there's no GPL, so it's GPL or commercial. Um, but it's, it's tooling, right? You, don't, you usually don't ship this. So, um, you can get a long way with GPR. Okay, oh, one more.